I would like to open up the conversation, the uh, discussion. Uh, you've listened to each other's point of view. There's some of you that seem to have similar points of view. Some might be a little bit different. Uh, does anyone want to jump in and react, respond to some of the things that were said by some of our friends and colleagues here so far? Yeah, uh, you can, we can use the uh, raise hand function. I'll keep track of it. I think it'll be easier. I see your, I, yeah, I mean the actual raise hand function, correct. So I see Chris. Chris, feel free to unmute and, and jump right in. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for the, the the different 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 talks. I I, I feel like there were different perspectives, but it, it, we're still operating from within a, a maybe a more refined. Uh, a, 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 you know, it, there, there could have been even more perspectives. It would, it would have been good. I just wanted to ask Jim about because I, I was struck by when you were going through the examples of the cases uh, uh, recently about um, the way in which you know obviously. Uh, academic freedom can be used to kind of fight for those who the EDI would fight for as well, right? And obviously the, there's the fame, the big case the last few years at University of Toronto, um, and you mentioned others as well. One of the things I've really noticed in taking, uh, uh, you know, becoming interested in this over the last few years, it, and, and I mean, we noticed this when we did a survey of faculty last year, is that for certain kinds of people, they they almost refuse to think that there was a problem about academic freedom and that they would say, well, there are real cases like the one at University of Toronto. Uh, but in other cases, say like Francis Widdowson, uh, you know, and other cases where people are, people's academic freedom is being shut down because they are taking more politically controversial stances uh, uh, on that, that aren't kind of generally on the progressive side. Well, that's not really a problem. That that's legitimate. I just wondered what you what you thought about that and the extent to which there is, as I would see it, a kind of almost willful cluelessness about what's actually going on in Canadian universities. I'm not sure it's a willful cluelessness. Um, if one looks at the long history of discussions on freedom of expression, I'll get to academic freedom in a moment. It's a concept that almost everybody subscribes to until they come across expressions they don't like. And then, well, it doesn't apply in that case. And similarly with academic freedom, there are lots of champions of academic freedom who say, yeah, when it's people who have ideas like me and they're challenged, then they need to exercise their academic freedom. Uh, but when it's people I dislike or whose views I find odious, well, that's not an issue of academic freedom. Um, and I mean, Widowson is a, is a good example of, of uh, a lot, and, th and there are many others. Um, I mean, historically, uh, the defense of Marxists who uh, were having their academic freedom violated uh, ran into real difficulty and be defended during the 40s and 50s and 60s, the McCarthy period. Uh, now, it's often people on the right whose views are, are attacked that are not defended. Uh, the nature of academic freedom, the problem is, the real issue is what are the limits to academic freedom? Um, and the limits to academic freedom are vague in the sense that, uh, I mean, we, we recognize all sorts of limits. We recognize that when, if there's six of us who are teaching different sections of a first year course, and there's an agreement amongst the six with one dissenting as to using a common textbook, uh, am I obliged to use that textbook? Uh, I mean, where, where a decision is handed down administratively, then that is a violation of academic freedom. We recognize collegial limits on academic freedom. Uh, disciplinary boundaries, if I'm a, a biologist and over the uh, December holidays, I, be, I, have a, I become a born again Christian and want to treat, teach creationism in my first year biology course as science, I don't have the academic freedom to do that. Nor if I'm an astronomer, uh, can I teach astrology as astronomical science in my astronomy course? So, I mean, broadly, there are disciplinary boundaries as to what is protected by academic freedom, but those have to be very loosely uh, understood or else they become a form of inappropriate uh, uh, imposition. So, I mean, that's a long-winded way of saying it's always contested what those boundaries are. I would suggest that uh, the default position has to be allow it to be more inclusive um, and that uh, uh, protecting, uh, as long as there's evidence somebody is undertaking their work in a serious scholarly way, then their right to pursue that has to be defended even if it's deeply unpopular. And our ability to defend academic freedom 
whether it's in the cases like I mentioned of Valentina Azarova or Kim Yip Chun, which most people would agree with uh, who are progressive, it also means defending people we might find whose views we might find odious. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I can't answer your question more specifically than that, uh, other than just this general inclination to say, well, academic freedom applies to people I agree with, but not to people I disagree with. That's absolutely okay. false. Can I, can I just have a quick follow? Because I, I, I think I generally agree with you. Uh, the, the dilemma is that in, in, the, in, in today, in that so many of the, the threats to academic freedom come from within the university and from within our from our colleagues, basically, and students. And then when when the the kind of political orientation of the university is so skewed compared to the general population that then it's much more likely that certain people will be targeted and certain and certain groups of people will will, be, will consider it kind of fine because it it's, it seems like these are people who's who who are odious and and they're they're defined as odious in the way I was saying about you know understand harm and races and all of these new kinds of ways. And this this is this seems to represent a kind of new kind of problem because it's not often coming from the top down. It's not the administrators. It's coming from colleagues and students. Well, I mean, you're right. I'm going to let Jim. I'm going to give you just a minute to respond yeah, to that, okay. and we're going to move on to Elaine and Julius. Julius, you can use the little function if you like. Uh, uh, there's a little function to uh, raise your hand. Uh, I guess I'll I'd say in a minute, Chris, is that threats to academic freedom coming internally are not new. Uh, we think of it as well, a wealthy donor, an alumnus, somebody interfering from the outside in the university wants to build a moat around itself to protect itself. But the reality is historically and now, much of the attack on people's intellectual work is coming internally. Uh, and we have to deal with that. And, and at CAUT, we had often, I mean, most of the cases we had were defending people who were unpopular. Uh, whether it be Widdowson or um, uh, Philippe Rushton, uh, to say, well, we profoundly disagree with what they're doing, but they're serious scholars, and the way to deal with them is not to write them out, but to be critical. So if I don't like what Widdowson is saying, which I don't, then I should write something about it, and, and that's the way we deal with things in the university, not by trying to cancel them or otherwise get rid of them, as long as they meet the test of, of uh, being engaged in uh, a serious scholarly approach to their work. Great, thank, thank you, Jim. Elaine, do you wanna un unmute and jump in, and then Julius? Um, so there's just a question and a comment um, in the Q&A that I'll respond to um, from, I'm going to mispronounce this, and I do apologize in advance. Jaswam, um, um, ask, talking about underlying the issue of privilege and who gets to even speak at events, and that's an ongoing issue, particularly for example, in-person conferences where the same actors tend to be there simply by who can afford to be there. I certainly can't afford to cross the street, so you rarely will see me at these things. Um, on the question about the conversation of social class has been raised in our hiring conversations. Um, I'm not a professor, by the way, I'm precariously employed outside of academia. Um, how do we evaluate social class identities of students or faculty? One of the things that has come up repeatedly on the student side, for example, if you look at our resumes in relation to students from privileged class backgrounds, we can't compete. I can't, you know, we. You come from poverty. You can't afford to do unpaid volunteer work. You can't afford to go to supposed third world countries to save lives. You just don't. You just don't have those things. And in terms of, of you know faculty and other staff members and how do you include social class? It's how about we start evaluating applications, not from traditional forms. So if it is it is prospective faculty, how about their journey is respected in and the non-traditional trajectory. So maybe they don't have 30 publications in tier one publications, but maybe they've done all these other amazing things in their jobs. And a lot of experience tends not to be respected. And here is what an interesting situation, I'll tell you quickly. I was on a hiring committee. The token black person at the university was brought in to do bias training. They didn't wanna talk about race. They wanted to talk about social class and how their resume CV meant they would never get hired as tenured faculty. And that conversation was shut right down. And I know I didn't understand social class other than lived experience until it was 
my class consciousness was forced upon me when rich students, rich white male students in a classroom were making fun of poor people poor white people and calling us white trash. That was my come to Jesus moment of understanding that there's a term, a label from the world I come from. So this understanding the language around social class and being able to even talk about it, I would never talk about coming from poverty other than in relation to my research and needing to be really clear about my positionality in relation to my research. So not like a, I don't have these perfect answers, but I know that hiring processes, and I've sat on a lot of hiring committees as a graduate student representative, they're just choosing the same characters rather than honoring the different trajectories that people come from. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, it's important, what you've said is very important, so I, I took note of it, I will get back to it. Uh, this is just a note for everyone. The q and I go through and I try to synthesize them so you don't have to worry about that. I'll be asking all these questions beginning at, uh, three o'clock. So now we're just going to stick to the topics we address amongst ourselves, and then we'll open up to the audience at three, and I'll take care of that. But you're raising excellent points. Julius has been raising his hand, uh, literally, physically, so <laughs> you can put your arm down and speak. There are two, uh, I'm a little worried uh, about Elaine's position on social class, not because I don't agree with it. On the contrary, as a lifelong socialist, I always believe that was the most important thing, but I don't think that the fight against uh, poverty uh, can be effectively won at the university. I think it has to be won by through redistribution of taxes, uh, wealth, uh, through uh, making certain that no one is in poverty. Uh, I don't think that a committee at a university is in a good position they can try. But I, I think it will be harder. It'd be just as, as difficult as to solve the problem of other forms of uh, uh, discrimination. But I, what, I, what I do want to point out is that EDI has had a disastrous effect on the university. What we're watching is the decline of the university. Decline of the university, and you can see the following things. In the United States where it's clear, enrollment is followed. Research is often done outside in private, which is very dangerous because that puts pa tremendous power into private hands, uh, but it's done in outside uh, uh, foundations, um, military, uh, all sorts of things. Um, uh, new jobs require university degrees less and less. So people in the United States find that it doesn't really pay to spend four years or eight years studying when the job will not require it. The only thing that is still required and keeps universities going is the accreditation function, in law, medicine, or dentistry, or uh, whatever. Um, the academic community has been shattered by the identity crisis. There's no longer, for instance, you can't risk socializing between uh, professors and, and, and students because it's so risky if you get accused of having said something or done something or hurt somebody. And yet this academic community, and I'm certainly not talking there about uh, any forbidden activities, but merely the notion of a community based on knowledge is uh, disappearing. Um, the student power, the power given to students to evaluate, to decide who teaches them, uh, while some form of evaluation may be useful, uh, also favors those who want it easy and who is, no longer uh, want to be challenged in their identity views, in their views of the world. So the result is that universities are declining and they may be replaced by other sorts of groups, uh, people forming private discussion groups, private ac academic or intellectual communities. But EDI is not harmless. It makes the university less of a place for the pursuit of knowledge, of uh, research, and for the accreditation, necessary accreditation of good professionals, uh, which used to happen. So I think EDI, uh, by the stress on identity, is basically shattering the academic community. Thank you, Jim. Jim, you wanted to jump in? Yes, I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, comment on some of Julius's comments initially and now. Um, 
I think it's, I think, uh, Julius, that you're really overstating things. To say there's an obligatory I ideology that's dominating the university, all of us on this panel, and I imagine most of the participants in, in this conference are evidence that that's not quite the case. There are people who want to impose a, a dominant ideology, but I don't think, uh, I think it's overstating the case to say there is one. Uh, I think it's overstating the case to talk about trigger warnings. Tr there was huge pressure for trigger warnings uh, in the United States, that challenge was taken up by the American Association of University Professors, who have a wonderful statement on why trigger warnings are inappropriate. Uh, by and large, trigger warnings are not used widely in Canada. Um, in terms of your your uh, talk about uh, uh, identities, I think that you're you're right, except that the problem with the talk about identities is not, we all have multiple identities, that reality is being lost in a lot of the discussions, and it's the essentializing of certain identities. Uh, so people like Adolf Reed Jr. and others who've written and talked a lot about this, I think have a lot to say. So uh, it's, it's, it's the denial of the complexity of our identities that's the problem, and essentializing them essentially to gender and race. As if those supplement or those uh, uh, treat make all of their identities irrelevant. I think that relates to Elaine's point, where identities related to class almost disappear from any discussion. And people like Adolf Reed Jr., who raise them, are are labeled as as uh, uh, class reductionists, uh, when in fact it is the reduction of the complexity our, that's the issue, not the fact that we have multiple identities. And finally, the decline of the university. The, the university, in my view, is declining. I mean, we've been writing uh, about this for decades. Uh, Bill Reading's uh, universities in university in ruins. Uh, the commercialization and commodification of the university is having a devastating effect on it. But it, it's having devastating effect because of the, with, and you didn't mention anything, the withdrawal of public funding. I mean, there are American universities like the University of Vermont, where I think only 5% of its revenue now comes from the state. Uh, in Canada, the percentage of, of public revenue going to public universities is declining, and the result is a massive increase in in the money that's being having to paid by students, and that means they're less able to participate in the university community because they're having to go to school, they're having to work full time jobs. Uh, it's it's having devastating effects. Um, so, and the community is also dissipating because of it becoming virtual. You know, when I taught sociology at the University of Toronto or when I was a graduate student years before that at Berkeley, you could go in almost any day, time of the day or night, and there were faculty around, you'd have discussions. I went back to my sociology department uh, 10 years ago. You could fire a cannon down the hall at noon and you wouldn't hit a soul except for some of the staff. I mean, we, we've, uh, the social media and the internet has made us uh, have our colleagues internationally not so much locally, and that's really undermined uh, the nature of the community. So there are all, I mean, you're absolutely right about the university being harmed, but I, I think it's for re reasons beyond those that you mentioned. Thank you, Jim. Julius, I know you want to respond, and I'm going to let you respond. I just want to remind people to raise their hand, because I can't see all of you. So raise the little hand. So Chris, for example, I can't see you on the screen. So if you want to jump in at one point, use the little raise hand uh, icon. Same with Mark. Julius, I, please. Yeah, I certainly uh, did mention the lack, lack of funds. I said the whole thing came from neoliberalism and the fall of the university, uh, fun, uh, massive funding. So yes, the lack of funds is behind the decline of the university. It's also behind the group competition because each uh, there's less money uh, to go around. Uh, I agree with you on the technology, but that, I guess, would be part of what I talked about with the decline of the community. The community declines for all sorts of reasons. One of them is fear, but the other one is also simply that people don't meet. They meet on screen as we're meeting right now, and they don't, they don't uh, uh, see each other uh, in the same way. But one way or the other, I think uh, we are uh, uh, in decline. And the third reason I would say for the decline is because you cannot stand up for what is considered uh, elite subjects. You can't stand up for the great classics. You, you can't insist on, on uh, correct use of English and French. Uh, or you, in Quebec, you can a little bit, but yeah, on, on the French side, but not so much on, uh, on the English side. You, um, 
there's a watering down of the academic tradition, but it's, it all comes down to the fact that there's insufficient funding and not enough of an academic mixed non-identity community. Would somebody like to jump in and follow up on this? Chris, yes, please. Sure. I mean, that, that, I, I enjoyed that exchange. That was good. I, I found I found myself listening to both uh, of you, uh, 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 Jim and Julius, and especially Jim. I was thinking the only thing I didn't agree with what you said was just that there wasn't uh, a kind of reigning orthodoxy. And I, I mean, I suppose I would take from you the sense that there are gaps in it. It's not complete. It's not, you know, it's not a total he hegemony. There are spaces. If you already have tenure, you can speak out against things as, as, as I do. But I, you know, uh, I speak to graduate students who write me emails when I when I write an op-ed in the National Post, and they they say, "What what should I do? I I don't agree with you know pick the issue you know whether it's EDI or whether it's the things I write about historical issues in, in my own discipline." And uh, the advice I have to give them is, "Don't say anything because you don't have tenure. You're just a graduate student and." I absolutely know that you will be punished uh, for speaking out against the grain of a certain kind of orthodoxy. And, you know, I, I, I know that in my own case, because a couple of summers ago, we uh, a couple of us organized this letter writing a letter campaign against the Canadian Historical Association when they made a statement saying that there is a single historical interpretation about Canada's treatment of its Indigenous peoples. It counts as genocide. And ultimately, about 660 or so professors wrote and said this is not an appropriate thing to do. This is a real assault on academic freedom. Uh, that was really the CHA president and the committee pushed that aside. Uh, it certainly didn't change their mind. And I know from someone who sat in the committee, they they actually talked about having a blacklist for not citing uh, people, not including people who were, who signed that letter. I don't, you know, I wasn't, I'm not on the CHA executive. I don't quite know what happened. So I, I mean, I, I I genuinely take all your points about the, all the problems of the university. And, and I think we, we get along and, and have a lot to say about that. I really do think that. I just think that even if the hegemony is incomplete, there's definitely, a, there are definitely topics that you can speak about and can speak about. And if, and if you do speak about them, you have to be sure that you do it very carefully and for positions of relative tenure safety. Thank you, Chris. Mark, I think you raised your hand. I'm not sure. You're muted. No, you didn't raise your hand. Okay. Did anyone want to follow up on, on Chris's comment? Maybe perhaps Jim wants to reply to it or yes, Jim. You have to unmute, you're still muted. I largely agree with Chris, uh, but what I would say is none of this is new. What the what the what the pressure to conform to a certain viewpoint is at any particular time changes. But if one looks, if one reads memoirs of academics over or looks at histories of universities, there were, I mean, when I was a graduate student, uh, I was nervous to raise certain kinds of things. Uh, depending on who my professors were. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, uh, dominant views. Uh, you think with also within uh, institutions. I mean, there was a huge battle at the University of Manitoba, which was one of the few, uh, maybe the only university in Canada whose economics department wasn't dominated by a neo-Orthodox uh, economist. And uh, the dean there some years ago asked the chair of the department why our department is so different. And, and the chair, uh, who was one of Canada's leading economists and a heterodox economist said because I think we should have a diversity of viewpoints in our and he and the dean said that's going to change and there was a huge battle that then went on for some years where uh, to try to get rid of the heterodox economists. I mean we 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 have those battles I'm sure in history departments there are one saying well we shouldn't really be worried about 17th and 16th century. Uh, I, I mean, the university is a very difficult, historically has been a very difficult place for anyone who challenges whatever the prevailing views of the time are. It was so bad in the 17th and 18th century in, in Britain that most of the interesting intellectual work was done in royal societies and learned societies, not in the university. So I think we're talking about generic problems. That doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about them, but I think we have to understand 
that they are somehow endemic in the nature of the university and if anything are more difficult to deal with as a result of that rather than something new that's just come up by the current crop of of uh, people in the university you, you don't have to convince a historian that something isn't new it's all old <laughs> Uh, can I can I build on that? I just want to remind Mark and and uh, Elaine that you now I can't see you. So if you do want to jump in, feel free to just raise your hand and jump in. Just building on what Jim said um, and circling back to your introductory comment when uh, when you uh, addressed indigenous knowledge, and you said I think rightfully so that indigenous knowledge uh, is a methodology. Uh, it's a it's knowledge that was defended thanks to academic freedom, so that these uh, academics and do their work but based on, on, on their knowledge. I have a question about this because <clears throat> I, I find it odd uh, that a, um, how, how, do I put, how can I put this? Um, what it involves is that a knowledge is tied to a people or to a group, um, as opposed to it being tied to a methodology which belongs to no one really, right? And so it could be questioned, it has strengths and weaknesses, and so on and so forth. And I understand that academic freedom helped defend that. Do you have the sense, however, that given that it's so intimately tied to a population, to a group, that it is difficult for academics to even be critical of uh, these types of methodologies, for example, uh, which you could extend to, do you believe that in universities, it is difficult to be uh, critical of EDI initiatives or social justice or whatever it is that people want to be critical of? It's often difficult to be critical of any of the things you've named because of social pressures on you not to be critical. But one can certainly be critical. That is, an indigenous scholar can put forward a certain uh, understanding of the world based on indigenous knowledge that if you feel is wrong or is not a helpful way of saying to, to be critical, certainly. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the fact that we recognize that that people can do their work from an indigenous knowledge perspective is different from saying that anyone who does that work is above criticism. Uh, there can't be things that are above criticism in a university. Correct. So in other words, a university is a place of uh, ideas, debates, all ideas, uh, even the ones we disagree with, and there should be room to discuss this. Chris, you, you, um, you surveyed academics, right? Uh, did you get the sense based on, on this survey that people feel like they can have discussions about these things? Uh, well, it, depend, it depends on who you asked, right? So there was certainly okay. a chunk of, there was a chunk of the, of the population of, of professors, depending on the issue you asked about, who were regularly self-censoring on topics. And you know the kinds of topics that you would expect them to be self-censoring on, like we're talking about today, about EDI, about indigenization. Um, maybe it was a bit more mixed around issues about the the, the uh, Middle Eastern and Palestinian Jewish conflict. I think you get both sides there. Sometimes in the environmental movement in Alberta, for example, some professors talked about that. So there was there was a range of political variability, although largely it was it was professors who were um, either on the right or maybe centrist and left, but 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 in a heterodox fashion, they didn't feel like they could question these things. And that was certainly the case that they felt on certain topics. They were just, it was just like touching the third, the, the third wire, right? Or the third line. Like it was, it wasn't worth the, it wasn't worth the danger to them to do so. Uh, and that was pretty typical. And then, and then conversely, there was a chunk of respondents we had, you know, a small group, but a, but it's a you know sizable minority who who interpreted anyone who would question uh these kinds of things as in you know intrinsically discriminatory that they should be shut down you know that they, they would so uh, you know the, the type of response we would get in, in the text box would be well I, I think people should be able to speak what they want you know unless they're going to say a discriminatory thing and, and you know do things in the classroom and then of course they should be shut down and so it's a you know it's not surprisingly a kind of uh heated debate Oh, did somebody want to respond to that? I'm sorry, I think I cut someone off there. No, okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I understand. Is it at 2.30, uh, Chris, that you have to leave? 
Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll, well, I'll let Julia speak. And, and... One thing. Well, I did want to say one thing. Indigenous knowledge is, of course, something that is is important to teach, and people have taught it. And Jim correctly identified it as a subject that was saved by academic freedom. But there's one point on which you could get into Trump. I believe that an indigenous scholar need not be indigenous. And yet you know very well that those people who are promoting the thing will insist on it. will think that that is a cultural appropriation. A cultural appropriation is of course another thing that is part of the uh, ideology. Elaine, yeah, please go ahead. So there's, three types of scholars who talk about poverty. There are those with lived experience and they're very, very few and far between. And they're very explicit about their positionality. Then there are those, I don't have the right language. There are those that really profoundly understand social class, poverty, discrimination, lack of access to our human rights. Um, and they're, they're absolutely brilliant, but they don't have lived experience. And then there's a whole whack of people without any lived experience who as Vivian Adair, she's an American poverty class scholar comes from generational poverty, who talks about how there's a group that are researching down upon us, speaking about us without us, reinforcing stereotypes, generalizations, that we're deficit, that we need accommodation, that there's, we're, we're problematic, our bodies are problematic. So, I don't think you have to have lived experience um, as Julius just talked about to be able to do research with, for example, my area students from poverty. It can be done in beautiful, amazing ways, access to knowledges, literature, things that you know we don't have access. So I wanna be really clear about that um, because I find it disturbing. The And I used to kind of believe because I was just, so distraught over my experiences in university that why is it so often people without lived experience doing the research, but there are amazing people doing research without lived experience who really profoundly get it. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing Elaine that you would apply this logic to all groups, right? Okay. Can I circle back to one of the things to your uh, to your comment when we we began this? Um, um, you know, you talked about uh, basically you talked about exclusion um, and exclusion based on social class. So EDI is exclusion based on demographics, um, uh, language, uh, religion, color of your skin. In this case, you're bringing up the uh, social class issue. Do you think that the EDI initiatives, as we see them, perhaps in universities, actually solve, I get the feeling the answer is no, but do they solve the social class problem, which should be, some would argue, and this was presented this morning in the discussion we had, some, someone said, it's not about race, it's not about religion, it's really about the social class because our societies have focused on individuals as opposed to groups because groups do not capture the lived experience or the experience of individuals. And so their current state, for example, as reflected in social class might be a much better way of going about this. Do you think we're on the right track with the way we do things to make universities perhaps more accessible to people who don't otherwise have the means to have access to it? Um, that's an absolute no. So in my work, um, in my PhD, we looked at the gendered nature of poverty. So a group of women came together and there was, there was no, yes, we were all women. Um, so women identifying people, I had to keep the research. Of course, you professors will be happy. I kept my research very focused so I could finish, um, but it intersected with age, ability, parental status, geography, race, indigeneity, um, but social class was at the center of it. So what I have found with EDI is that this, this homogenizing groups, as I call it, as I said, social characteristic silos, is assumes all indigenous look, folks look the same, all black folks look the same, all LGBTQ folks look the same. And that's not the case at all. What we found in my research is that when we came together, 
by centering social class, we were a powerful group that could address the actual structural problems that excluded us from Canadian universities and come up with concrete solutions based on our lived experience and our education and our trajectories in life and our positionalities, but trying to get people in power in universities to actually take us seriously, even though we've come up with a social innovation model has been really, really difficult. So I'm coming alongside women who can apply for a job that I could be more qualified for, but I can't apply because I'm a white woman. And so this is, so now we're supposed to be in competition with one another, but I will tell you the beauty of centering social class. We didn't, we didn't have oppression Olympics at all in our work. There was no, I am more hard done by than you. There was an absolute respect that if you are a black woman, your lived experiences are going to be very different than mine, but we shared common language about what it like, what it's like to come from generational poverty. So would you say that the uh, socioeconomic status cuts across these different, uh, let's call them variables, uh, that's uh, me speaking as a researcher, cuts across or is it something that should be added as another consideration? And then this brings in maybe Julius's comment, which is, is this another group, um, you know, asking, perhaps rightfully so, of course, for you know, uh, the way he put it was me, 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 right? To be recognized and to be, to have a, you know, a seat at the table. I'm gonna say yes and no, um, because to create just another group, we're just gonna homogenize people from poverty like it's always done. I mean, there's all these dominant narratives about us that are, that are really damaging and stigmatizing and othering. So maybe rather than another group, we start looking and honoring the cultures and heritages and knowledge systems that we bring to the table and working towards destigmatizing. But we can't ignore that social class cuts across everything. So for instance, there is a triracial student that I'm colleagues with, and she wanted to center social class and poverty in particular in their work. And that did not sit well with power because they are, one of their, um, their, their father is black, so they're partially black. And what they speak about is that race matters until they go home, but they never, ever, ever escape poverty. So how can you ignore that social class piece? But I will say, if there was another category at a university, there might be a poverty class club that I could join. And at least maybe I would find my people. But again, now we're going to be homogenizing people without understanding the intricate ways that our lives are shaped in, in, in the different identities and different lived experiences. But it is really hard when we don't even have anything to start with. In a, in a lot of universities, and this is the result of CRCs, Canada Research Chairs, for example, um, <clears throat> a lot of this is done through I'm going to simplify and I'm, perhaps I'm oversimplifying, but through quotas, you know, so you have to have quotas for different demographic groups to reflect perhaps the Canadian society or Quebec society, or it's not clear what level of, of, of uh, society we're trying to reflect. How would that, you know, considering that um, and considering that, you know, uh, social, social eco economic status doesn't seem to be considered, what would you ask these EDI because we have some here with us today in the audience, right? People who run EDI groups and who implement e EDI initiatives. Um, what do you think they should be doing different and how? So I'll answer this based on what I have learned over the years. And widening access and participation models in universities, for example, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, they have not been very successful. So you can get the say that here's a quota, you got to bring in this group of students and this many, but nothing structurally ever changes. So we come into places where we maybe we don't have the right language, we don't have the right educational trajectories, we're homeless, living precariously, 
Um, we don't have familial support systems. We don't find our knowledge systems in the curriculums. So you can bring us in, but really should, I wonder, should we really be here? Um, quotas aren't going to help. And that's why sociology is so critical in my opinion, is if you're not going to address the structural reasons for our exclusion in the first place, we're not going to find equity and inclusion. And I would ask EDI people, don't just follow the Human Rights Acts and the Federal Employment Equity Act. You should be pushing Universities Canada, for instance, who a couple of years ago did their first ever EDI survey of, un of their member universities. And they said it was from an intersectional lens. I contact them and they said, oh no, no, we're not gonna include social class. Well then don't call it intersectional. So mm -hmm. don't just do the status quo bare minimum. Mm -hmm. one, one of the points you're raising in this, and I'm gonna open up the conversation is that, um, so for example, in my faculty, my department, um, at the doctoral level, so it's very competitive for students to get into the bachelor's and then the master's and the doctorate, very, very competitive. And so these are brilliant students, absolutely brilliant. And they, they some of them struggle to get through it uh, for reasons that are not academic and others, you know, just breeze through because, you know, maybe they're a bit smarter, maybe they have resources, maybe they have money, maybe they have family who supports them, all sorts of reasons. These are very complex things. We now have a system whereby uh, to promote diversity, we give students who are accepted into the program additional funding. It's, it's, a, it's like a, an award based on uh, the color of their skin, for example, um, or you know, if they're First Nations, Indigenous people. And I see great value in that, but at the same time, it seems to me, and this is where I'm getting at your point, that that money at that point is not well spent. It should be spent up front because one of the reasons why we don't have black doctoral <clears throat> students is because we don't have a lot of master's students who are black and we don't have a lot of bachelor's students who are black and so on and so forth. So the money should probably be spent up front. But this raises another question, which is building on, you, on, on your point, and I want to open up the conversation to everyone. And I'm going to push your buttons a little bit here, Elaine. Is that, is that the mission of a university? Is that the, what's the mission of a university? Are you talking publicly funded universities or privately funded? Uh, well, here they're all pretty much public, uh, most of them at least. Uh, so let's let's go with public, publicly funded universities. Well, let me, <laughs> let me ask this question. Why should poor people, working class people, people who do not have access to Canadian public funded universities be paying taxes to fund it? If all universities are gonna do is reproduce the same folks, then I do question the purpose and, and point of Canadian universities. Mm -hmm. Julius, but, was, Julius was quicker than you, Jim. He, he, he really, you know, he's put his heart into it. So Julius, you can go first and then, and then Jim. Thank you, Elaine. I, I think uh, the fight against poverty is an essential battle of our state. And as, again, I, I refer to my lifelong socialism, I believe we have to redistribute. But the purpose to, redistri uh, to redistribution is to make sure, and, and I think uh, Martin uh, pretty well showed that, that at the top level, there will be enough black candidates or other candidates, uh, minority candidates, handicapped candidates, if the redistribution takes place at a lower level and they go through schools um, and uh, good schools and have good health care and so on, there is no reason why they would not be uh, sufficient numbers to uh, uh, satisfy uh, those who think that it's always the same faces that come through. However, I do not think that it's the function of the university. The university does not have the power to uh, uh, affect major economic change. It has to be the state, the tax system, the uh, public and private education system. And the other thing that's wrong with quotas is, of course, the belief that if you have general equality of chances, you'll have the, the, the equality of results. In other words, uh, that you'll always have the right proportion of, of 
black, white, uh, Asian students. And in fact, history shows us that there are periods when one group or another has a flowering, where you have German music in the 18th and 19th century, where you have Greek philosophy at a particular point, where you have uh, uh, all sorts of particular moments, the, you know, Krakow School of Mathematics. Uh, one group suddenly has an advantage. It never lasts. It's not forever. It's for a period of time. Uh, and uh, you shouldn't require the results to be always pro in proportion to the population, because you will have periods of, of, of uh, excellence in a particular group. However, short answer to what you say is I think the fight against poverty is a social and a political fight. It cannot be waged by the universities. They're having a difficult enough time uh, transmitting knowledge and doing research. Uh, it's the public schools, the health system, the environment that will, the municipal system that will create general equality across the society. And there's one more point. I think if you do create that equality, it will not mean preserving each group's uh, culture. What happens is the groups will flow into each other. If there is no economic basis for the difference, then undoubtedly people will not have the sort of uh, uh, cultural differences, dialect differences and so on that exist right now. They will float, they will merge. The groups will merge. Before we move to Jim, Elaine, do you, did you want to respond to that? Well, I'm, I have a little tension, Julius, in that I think that you, why do universities not have a responsibility and their actors to address our societal problems? I mean, what else are sociologists supposed to be for? I, I just think that there's so much that these people in these places could do to address it. So. For example, and there's a question in the chat room, and so it's gonna, I'm gonna address it because I have this beautiful infographic that looks at the history of poverty discrimination legislation across the last 20 years. And every time poverty has been put forward to be prohibited grounds of discrimination has been unanimously voted down by all political parties at the federal level. Now imagine if poverty became prohibited grounds of discrimination, and that was put into human rights acts at the federal level, provincial, territorial, and then it be poverty class people became part of the Federal Employment Equity Act, all of a sudden EDI would include social class. I just think that the actors in universities can do so much more, even if it was to K to 12 outreach, to teach teachers how they're pipelining students from poverty into nothing, into the trades, into colleges, assuming that universities aren't places for them. I just have, I know universities are under fire and have been under fire for a long time. I just think that you know, people in universities could be doing more than they are. And maybe even if it just starts at the place where you're not penalizing students and further putting students from poverty behind the eight ball because they can't possibly compete with their peers who have these fancy resumes. So you're not eligible for the bursaries and scholarships because you simply can't compete. Universities could do something about that. Jim, you wanted to jump in? Actually, I'm ambivalent of jumping in. I mean, we're ranging over such a wide uh, scope of, of issues that I'm not sure it's, it's all that useful because I mean, well, let's bring it back to the, the, to elements, the mission. Of everyone, every, elements of what everyone says is right and elements are wrong. Um, the, there's no question that what we see at the university in terms of the absence of people uh, of uh, working class and modest backgrounds, uh, the relative absence of people from marginalized communities have their roots in broader in systemic racism in our society, systemic uh, disregard for, for poverty as an issue and for people who are poor. Uh, our school system uh, streams people out. Uh, the, the amount of money that there would be in, in uh, upper class school districts is, or 
school areas as opposed to working class school areas. I mean, all these things have a bearing on who ultimately ends up in university and have to be addressed in the very ways that others have talked about. I guess all I would say is at the same time, while that is being addressed, which is a long-term process, we also have an obligation, I think, of universities to try to do things to provide some modification of the circumstances students from uh, marginalized communities are in now. Not saying, well, we'll get this fixed over the next 50 years. In the meantime, too bad for you. Uh, and, you know, Julius does rightly point out that there have been times when different groups have flowered and so forth. But there are also uh, indigenous people in this country have been waiting hundreds of years for their time to flower. Uh, and it hasn't happened. Um, you know, what number of communities today don't even have uh, suitable drinking water? I mean, we have huge problems that have to be addressed. And I think universities have a play, a role to play in trying to, they're not the solution. But in the meantime, it's not suitable for the university to say, well, we're just going to take whoever comes along and, and we have no obligation around these things. Uh, I think we do. Mm -hmm. Those are great points. One of the things that Elaine referred to is, uh, you know, academics should be interested in these diverse populations, for example, through research, outreach, and so on, if I got this correctly, Elaine. Um, and that's what university professors do, right? Normally, we do quite a bit of research, we teach, uh, we, we try to address issues that are sometimes difficult to be discussed uh, outside the university, that's, that's part of our mission. But should we be going further than that? And I think Jim is sort of saying yes. Julius, I think, is saying kind of no, I think. Elaine is saying yes, we should go uh, beyond doing the research. Is it a matter of us as universities becoming examples, serving as examples for society? Or is it even beyond that? Where do we draw the line? Is, is there even a, draw, a line to be drawn here? It's a difficult line to draw. But we certainly have a role in describing poverty, in uh, showing what the effects of it are, in uh, uh, scientific research, for instance, into the questions of indigenous communities and water and, and, and so on. What I'm not certain is that the university is well suited to actually doing the redistribution without losing its uh, uh, research and uh, uh, study uh, role. Uh, I don't think we can physically, with the money we have and so on, actually affect the redistribution. We can influence it. We can militate for it. We can do all sorts of things that will get it. I hope uh, Jim is wrong. It won't take 50 years. But if we did have the right policies, it would take 25. But I am not certain that we're well suited for the actual act of redistribution. Sorry, Jim, you wanted to jump in? Well, we had some of these discussions in the 80s and the 90s around the uh, real discrimination that had clearly existed for decades against women in the university. And there was a major push to increase uh, not only greater equality and pay for women, but in opportunities. I mean, overwhelmingly full professors were men. As you went down to uh, assistant professors, they, it was more balanced in terms of the makeup of our society. And arguments were made, well, we can't really do anything about this because we have to base it just on excellence. Well, we did try to do things about it. We've made some major gains, and I don't think the excellence of the university has suffered one whit. So um, I, I just think there's a scope for trying to address some of the inequities. Uh, I think that's the underlying philosophy behind EDI. And as I began my talk, that aspiration is desirable. We can't, you know, Julius is right. We can't fix the problem of, of an unequal society, of a fundamentally, uh, of a fundamental neoliberal society. The university can't fix that, but it can do things to ameliorate some of the effects of that. So there's a little a greater equity and opportunity uh, for people uh, who are not from privileged or um, um, majoritarian uh, communities. Mark, is that, are you raising your hand? Just, just waving. Okay. <laughs> okay. Elaine, did you, did you want to respond to that or follow up on this? I guess I would, um... 
I would just hope that universities became actors who didn't contribute to existing problems. So for instance, something as simple as when research is done, if it's done to actually solve problems, not just critique and discuss problems. And you know, when I think about students from poverty, myself being one of them, you know, had the university been a different space, I might not be in the position I'm in. The whole point of my going to education was to escape poverty and further, you know, and, and to prevent more poverty across generations. Um, but there weren't supports and understandings in place to help that. So all the women in my research are so buried alive in student loan debt to, to go to school for the very same reason they will never financially recover. So universities could, for instance, play a role in challenging the idea that student loan system and student debt system levels the playing field, because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But to understand also that it isn't just about money. It's about finding places and spaces where we feel we belong, that our lived experiences have some place in theory classes. Do you think, and this is a question that I, I'm going to open up to all of you, that part of the part of the tensions between what we let's call it EDI initiatives at large, right? Um, with, with the understanding that it doesn't capture everything, and Elaine, I heard that very cl clearly. But that e the tensions between EDI and, and, and potentially academic freedom, because I think it seems quite clear, I think we could agree on this, that there are tensions between the two, and maybe we'll get to that uh, again later. Do you think it's just the result of different visions or views of what the mission of the university might be? <laughs> Julius, did you want to answer that first? Well, I, I think it's in part that. It's in part uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, the university is, is, is an instrument of redistributing. And, you know, when you look at one of the things that I mentioned before, the accreditation um, uh, function of the university, obviously, by changing our admission into medical school and law school, we could do some very minor redistribution. We could make certain that there are a few more doctors of this origin or that, that origin. But I think it would generally be, and it's not that we necessarily shouldn't ever do it, but it would generally be rather ineffective. Nothing as effective as a, a, a books in economics that would induce a society to uh, have a, 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 a more egalitarian system uh, in, in terms of income and, and property. Jim, did you want to respond as well? Um, no, I'll pass for now. You'll pass for now. Okay. I, uh, we only have a few minutes left, left before we get, we get to questions. Uh, Julius, I want to get to a, a point before we move to the questions, and I want to ask you this, because what, one of the things you're saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I apologize in advance if I push your buttons on this, you're saying one of the problems with the EDI and the culture around this, um, and in some ways I, I definitely 100% agree with you, is that um, it's a lot of identity politics or group identities that are clashing, correct? Um, and you know, I'm French Canadian. My family's been here since uh, 1666, so they've been here for for a while. Um, and and that comes with a history, of course, and and it comes with a it shapes my identity. You're 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 Jewish. I think you were born in in Poland. Uh, that comes also with uh, you know with a lot of history and shapes your your identity. And and as you know, McGill had quotas um, on Jews for you know the longest time. Don't you think that, uh, I guess it's twofold. The first one is, is it even feasible to think that people can move beyond these identities and the groups they identify with to avoid these conflicts? That's the first part. And the second part is, do you think EDI initiatives might be a way of giving access to some groups to uh, universities 
just like uh, Jews were given access to universities at one point, uh, you know, when they lifted the quotas and French Canadians and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't really believe, I think I have a totally, pretty well, totally negative view of identity. Uh, I think uh, obviously we can't know everything and people can be specialized in, in, in one type of music or one type of literature. We can only speak, uh, most of us are limited to a few languages uh, and so on. But I, uh, just to give you your example, uh, it's true that I was born in Poland of a Jewish family, but I, I'm not Jewish. I've consciously said, I don't want it, don't need it. And uh, it's not a question of not being observant, it's a question of rejecting. I think people should move away from identity. Uh, of course, on, voluntarily. If somebody wants it, it's a matter of an absolute freedom of association. There is nothing to be said. Uh, but I uh, personally uh, do not find parochial identities to be a satisfactory way of expressing one's cultural, creative, scientific, uh, thought. Uh, I, I do believe in mixing, and I think the ideology of, of people, groups flowing together is the one most conducive to producing a, a, ju a just society. Um, the, uh, obviously, of course, we are the product of what we learned in childhood and, and uh, of our parents and obviously of the history so that French Canada uh, influenced what you are, although it also influenced what I am because I fundamentally grew up in Quebec. Um, uh, the, uh, to me, identity is not 100% negative, but it's a 90% negative. It's something that people should strive to rise above. And uh, uh, the more you create, what Joe Clark said was a terrible thing. He said, Canada is a community of communities. I don't like communitarianism. I think Canada is a place for individuals to live together uh, and without any uh, necessary uh, uh, communitarian uh, belonging, as long as you don't force them to do that. Okay. Thank you. I, I I mentioned this because uh, the uh, being born in Poland. I hope I didn't offend you because it's no it's no on, no. It's on Wikipedia, so yeah, I did my research. Um, and, and I guess you're you're Jewish, just like no my, pardon. I have no no shame. I don't think my ancestors are any worse than anybody else's. I just I'm a believer in universalism. I haven't joined any other group. Yeah, well, that's one of the things you mentioned in your intro. You know, universalism. I you know I. Uh, I guess I'm a recovering Catholic myself. <laughs> I haven't quite gotten there. We're going to open up for questions unless somebody wants to. Oh, Jim, sorry, go ahead. I saw. I just saw your hand now. Yeah, I, actually, I, I want to recommend a book for people who are interested in the issues we're talking about. It's one by Susan Neiman, N-E-I-M-A-N, uh, who is an American philosopher, uh, and it was just published this year. It's titled Left is Not Woke. Uh, and the point she makes is we talk about this in terms of identity, but the fact is all of us have multiple identities. Um, you know, Martin, you're French Canadian, you're a university professor, you may be a parent. Uh, I mean, we have multiple identities. The issue isn't identity. And you know, there's talk about identitarianism. The problem is tribalism. And she talks about it in that way. That is where we take an identity, let it supersede everything else, and it becomes a kind of tribalism. That's the problem. Uh, and she lays it out nicely, which I don't have a chance to do it in the few minutes we have. That's that's a very, very interesting point. Very, very interesting point. Um, maybe we'll get back to it. I'm sure it's going to raise some questions. So I'm just going to start with uh, the first question. And, and I'm thinking this is for Jim, because uh, you talked about Edinburgh University I, at one yeah. point. Is that Was that you? So, so you mentioned EDI at Edinburgh University as being equality, diversity, and inclusion, right? So, uh, which is correct. It needs to be noted that we have well, what we have in Canada is equity, diversity, and inclusion. So, this person is saying the key difficulty is the equity piece that needs to be clarified. Um, Canada used to have equality under a traditional multiculturalism, but it changed to equity, which does not allow for merit, but involves filling quotas. Did you want to? Perhaps respond to that? Yeah, I, I mean, 
the the difference between equality and equity is uh, the goal is really equity. Uh, you don't necessarily reach equity by trying to have equality for everyone. There are different ways in which there can be equity, even if there isn't equality. So uh, insofar as the Edinburgh um, uh, definition, I was I just grabbed something to talk about broadly what EDI was as an aspiration, but equity is the proper term. Equality, uh, trying to get everyone to the same income level or, or everything like that is not necessarily but we can have an equitable state, even if there are differences. Okay. Did somebody want to jump in and, and comment on, on that as well? Please just uh, unmute yourself because I can't, I can't see you right now. Uh, just a, a follow-up to that, to that question, Jim, because you said, and rightfully so, that we are multiple identities, right? So how do we make that how do we reflect that when we approach things through quotas? Is that even a good approach? Because a lot of EDI initiatives are built on quotas. Which, which groups are worthy of being considered um, in these inclusion, diversity, and, and uh, equity initiatives? It's a tough question, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a tough question in the sense, the, the aspiration is to have the university the people who are at the university more reflective of the general population of society. It grows out of a view that there is a fundamental uh, uh, humanity, uh, human rights that everyone deserves, and there's fundamental abilities that cross cut all various groups and so on. And so the university as it was in Canada in the 1940s and 50, overwhelmingly white men, what, there was something wrong with that. I mean, everybody would acknowledge it. Uh, uh, trying to, I, I'm not sure that there's an answer saying, well, these groups do, you know, I, I don't think that's a fruitful direction to go. I think it's to say, we're trying to make the university more open uh, to a variety of people who historically have been blocked from it for reasons other than their ability. They've been streamed out, uh, they've lived in poverty, uh, they've been in uh, marginalized communities of one sort, and there's a whole variety of reasons. And we're trying to overcome those. And I see EDI in its best sense as trying to do that, as saying the university should be a place that is more reflective of the diversity of society because talent is spread across the diversity of society. Uh, and the university's mission is not redistribution. The university's mission is education of students and advancement of knowledge. But we are actually better able to do that if we bring a, the more the greater diversity of our society into that work than saying one one segment of our society should dominate it, as has historically been the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question from uh, the audience, and uh, it refers to Elaine's comment. So the conversation on social class has been raised in our uh, hiring conversations. The person writes. The question I would ask Professor LaBelge is how do we evaluate social class identities of students or faculty? Would we be willing to have questions on that included in some way in processes? So I spoke to this earlier and I can't imagine um, self-disclosing on an application or resume and saying, hey, I come from generational poverty and by the way, I'm homeless right now, even though I've got a PhD, um, that would be deeply uncomfortable. But as I mentioned, um, if you can just honor the different experiences and trajectories that people bring to the table, rather than just looking for the same status quo of how success is defined. So if I've got, you know, I'm volunteering, you know, um, in my local community, to support people and that includes my grandma and my mom why isn't that valued as volunteer the same way as if i go to another country to save lives because you know I've, my parents are rich and can send me to those places or i've been able to do that or for example being able to do unpaid internships and that being a big you know yahoo on your cv when somebody else could never afford to do those things so I think looking at processes rather than asking somebody to self-identify their social class, um, and there's more literature coming out on middle-class folks, whatever that is, 
are, are saying that they're, you know, in the UK that they're working class because they don't want people going, hey, you're doing, you know, yeah, you've got all these benefits because you're, you're middle class. So now we've got these like weird class things going on, but just figure out why you're disqualifying that prospective student or that prospective um, tenure track prof. And why do you think that they don't hold up to that person that went to Oxford University? And does Oxford wonder, University auto automatically mean that you're, you know, the superstar of all superstars? I wonder, though, in, in, in concrete terms, like I understand being open in terms of, for example, past experiences that are reported in resumes and so on and so forth. Let, let me back up for a second. I, I got a lot of heat a couple of years ago because our program wanted to implement a system of points where we... Um, gave points to people based on their demographics. And so this was assessed, of course, you can assess, uh, you can see the color of a person's skin. And so through the interview, you don't have to ask them if, if they're white or black and, and so on. But there are things that are much more subtle, obviously, you know, ident gender identity, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. And because we wanted to have something much more diverse in terms of the pool, some amongst us felt that we should actually inquire about these things, which to me was, uh, completely out of line, un, uh, not feasible and, and, and unacceptable for various reasons. You can imagine someone might not be comfortable with their sexual orientation and so on. They're in a situation of stress and it's frankly none of my business. So how would you assess this for issues related to poverty? It, it, you know, is it through an interview? Is it, how, how do you ask for this? How do you, how do you, how do you document it? And how do you factor it in? I don't have any easy answer, but I will tell you if, if you came from poverty and you were interviewing me, we would have a di very different conversation than somebody without lived experience. We would, and it would be an amazing conversation because we would speak the same language and um, you would treat me in a different way than not always, I'm not trying to stereotype and say, oh, you know, people who aren't from poverty are all evil or bad or anything, but it would be different. But if you ask me to check boxes, I'm gonna have a difficult time. And we can look at this social characteristic siloing again of university applications where you might be able to check first generation student, or if you go to financial aid, you might check that box. But not all students are first in their family to go to university come from poverty. So there's mm -hmm. assumptions being made around that so I don't have concrete solutions to give to you other than it would be amazing if there was social class diversity on the hiring committee or the student application, you know, choosing committee, whatever you call these committees, that maybe organically these things would emerge. That would mm -hmm. just be a really good step is that social class diversity. And that's one of the challenges of EDI leaving out social class is that we don't have that kind of diversity. And so there's only been a handful of profs in all my years in university that will even publicly talk about coming from poverty. It is just such a hidden thing. So, and, and then will you face further discrimination? You know, do you want to put that um, check off the LGBTQT box? You know, what risks come with that? And mm -hmm. is it worth the risk? So I'm sorry, I don't have any concrete. It's complicated, of course, right? But, but the more we talk about it, the more we can come up with concrete solutions that aren't going to cause short and long-term harm. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna, again, this is a question from, I'm gonna switch gears a bit with another question from the audience. This is someone who asks, uh, who says, all of the most extreme threats to academic freedom and institutional integrity come from students and faculty, would you all agree that weak administrators, this is this person's uh, term, not mine, would you agree that weak administrators who employ a, a veto and overreact to apparent threats and perceived crisis greatly increase the problems? This is a question to all of you.
Well, let me start. The university now yeah. has university now has professional administrators in many cases, as opposed to the previous uh, times when they were more academic, they were more in, in, with the academics. And professional administrators in business and everywhere else are very cautious, they're afraid. In addition, we have sponsors and uh, sponsors for research, company sponsors, national sponsors, and so on. And uh, well, you saw the example of the University of Toronto where there was a three, clear threat of withdrawing funds if a, uh, a perceived anti-Israel uh, person were hired. Uh, well, we have the same problem. If a group of students were to start demonstrating in front of some company that is uh, uh, supporting research saying they've got a, uh, a racist professor there or they've got racist policies, universities, the administrators are, are usually not ones to stand up when that type of institutional threat comes up. So one of the problems of having identity groups is that those are the tactics they use. Demonstrations, writing to sponsors, um, uh, pickets, etc., precisely to remove perceived threats to their uh, favorite cause. Uh, and university, university administrations are fairly weak. They don't have a tendency to stand up and say no. Jim? Well, uh, I mean, the first comment just follows from what Julia was saying. People do demonstrate, do they do protest. That's part of what free expression of democratic right. society is. So they have every right to do that. Um, I, I mean, I first disagree with the premise of the question, which was that the principal threats to academic freedom come from students and, and faculty. A lot of the threats do come internally, but uh, I mean, if I, you know, Kenya Chum, the example I gave was one that came internally, but very much what happened to Valentina Azarova at University of Toronto recently was an external threat. They come from all, all different sources. Uh, the willingness of administrations to stand up to threats, wherever they come from, um, is quite inconsistent. Um, there are some universities where there's a tradition of this. I remember being at a conference with uh, a Vice President McGill. This was a decade or so ago. Uh, and we were talking about academic freedom and, and the pressure that donors put on. And she said, rightly, well, sometimes I just have to tell a donor when they say, we'll give you we'll give you $10 million provided you do X or Y, I just have to say no. And there's times you have to say no. Uh, there's others who are under various pressures from their boards and so on, or where the institutional traditions are different, where they won't do that. Uh, and no doubt the decrease in funding from for public universities is making senior administrators much less willing to say no to donations and to court, various kinds of partnerships, collaborations with corporations uh, where there are strings attached. Um, so it, it's a complex uh, thing. I, I haven't found a pattern in terms of um, all the senior administrators being weak or all being strong. Uh, certainly when I was at CET, I bemoaned the fact that so many were weak, uh, but there were also ones who were quite, uh, quite uh, uh, outspoken about defending academic freedom. Sometimes I wish the faculty association has been as good as their administration. Uh, other cases, it was just the opposite. Was the faculty association pressed the administration to do the right thing. Uh, we're just in a very difficult circumstance now with the underfunding of universities, with the lack of political commitment to universities that does create a sense of vulnerability that uh, increases the possibility that administrations will give in to inappropriate demands from donors or parents or students or uh, alumni or whomever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Julius, you, if I remember right, you last year, I, I think it was, wrote a paper about this, the issue of m money in universities and priorities yeah. of universities. Yeah, do you want to comment following on, on Jim's? Yeah. Uh... Well, I said very much what I uh, said today that neoliberalism and therefore the decrease in funding made the universities vulnerable and the, the result is that you can hardly stand up to uh, pressure. 
but of course, I always have the same idealistic solution, which is diluting the groups, di discouraging uh, one issue groups and so on. You can't force it in a free society. As Jim pointed out, demonstration is a basic right in a free society, and you can't tell them not to demonstrate. But uh, I think uh, a lot of the problems in universities come from the, the fact that there is fierce competition for rare funds and that people are, are acting accordingly and trying to get it uh, divided in accordance with their interests. It's the old story of how do you divide profits between capital and labor? How do you divide all sorts of things between competing groups? And we've reached a sorry situation in the university where I think we've, we're losing sight of academic freedom in order to accommodate the groups. Now, uh, I don't believe that any change, if we move in another direction, that will eliminate the problem altogether, or, or that there is any way of eliminating the problem altogether, and that a, an attempt to eliminate it altogether might bring in other difficulties, for instance, uh, on freedom of demonstration and uh, freedom of association. But I do think the university has to move towards greater universality and less attention to uh, identity groups and, and interest groups. Hey, I'm gonna, a next question, thank you for that. You, uh, I, I don't remember who it was, but someone spoke about um, uh, trigger warnings. I think it was Jim and, and Julia spoke about tr trigger warnings. Uh, what's, and this is a question for all three of you, What's your stance on safety in universities, safe spaces, and is there such a thing as a right not to be offended? Jim, you're muted. Yes, I flashed my hand quickly because I have very strong feelings about this. Oh yeah, uh, okay. There is no right <clears throat> in any democratic society to not be offended. I mean, the very nature of the public discourse that makes de uh, democracy possible means that everyone can participate in that discourse. And by definition, some of the things that some are gonna say are gonna offend others. So there is no right. Within the university, there is a place for safe spaces, although the university itself can never be a safe space. So uh, we have various I mean, Newman clubs and other religious uh, Hillel clubs uh, where people of a similar religion or a similar ethnicity could get together. Those can be safe spaces where Catholics who are trying to, how do I cope in this secular university can talk with each other and feel comfortable doing that. Uh, and, and I think it's perfectly appropriate for universities to make places available where people can get together and talk. Uh, sometimes students dorm rooms are, are those kind of places. But the university itself can never be a safe space. It can never say, well, you can't raise these kinds of issues. It might offend somebody else. Um, given the diversity of our society, there's hardly any idea that won't offend somebody. So I mean, you turn the university into a totally useless place, uh, could, which could never educate students effectively or advance knowledge if you had that notion. And simply trigger warnings, which come from a good intention to say, well, we won't, you know, we want to, we don't want our students to be traumatized by coming across a piece of literature or an idea. Well, I mean, the difficulty, and I mentioned uh, the American Association of University Professors a decade ago wrote a brilliant piece on trigger warnings and why they're a problem. And I encourage anybody just go to aaup.org and, and put in trigger warnings to see it. Uh, what would trigger somebody is infinite impossibilities. If I were a person who had been assaulted by uh, a thug wearing a red shirt, the, seeing somebody wearing a red shirt might trigger me. Um, if I say, well, you're gonna read this novel and you may come across, uh, in, you, in reading it, you'll come across a scene of rape or a scene of violence. Uh, that's gonna color how you even read it. And if you say to students, well, if, if you think you might be triggered by that, you don't have to read it. Well, if that novel is in your curriculum because it's an important thing, uh, to reduce the whole novel to one element in the novel, you know, you just, it, it really, uh, if, if people are having serious problems, and there are people who are traumatized and have those, then the way to deal with those is through the mental health services of the university, not through trying to turn uh, university classrooms into therapeutic uh, occasions. 
we don't ever try to necessarily antagonize or upset our students. That goes against basic pedagogy. On the other hand, we can't so be so risk averse that we create an environment where uh, we really distort the purpose of the of the education in order to avoid those problems. We need to have better mental health services available and accommodation services and refer students to those rather than trying to build, make every uh, faculty member a therapist who tries to deal with potential trauma in their classroom. Elaine, Julius, did you want to respond to that question as well? Yes, I, I would. I and maybe it's because of my age, but I do have struggles with the idea of safe spaces and trigger warnings, which aren't a new thing, by the way. I experienced the psychology class where the professor came up. This was when I was in college. You don't have to come to the next class because we're going to be watching a film that you may find deeply disturbing. And I couldn't understand why they were saying this to me because they didn't know anything about me. And I thought, well, I'm going into massive debt to be here. I'm hustling, working multiple jobs to survive. I'm not going to miss out on that opportunity to learn. And it was a video about fetal alcohol syndrome. So they made some assumption, weird assumption, but I went and it was deeply disturbing as it should be deeply disturbing, but I learned about it. Imagine if I couldn't, learn about sexism because I have experienced sexism in the workplace. But if I get to learn about it, and if I would have had this education and knowledge, I would have been able to address it in the workplace where it was absolutely blatant. I expect to be upset. Um, I don't think it's okay when professors are making these broad generalizations no, I could give you lots of examples that are really problematic, but I'm here to learn. I'm here to be challenged. And I can tell you when I go get a job, they're not going to go, Elaine, trigger warning, you don't have to come to work today. Or Elaine, you know, safe space is going to be created when you're doing your job. Um, I want university to prepare me, better prepare me for when I'm out there and to help me get the language and the theories and differing opinions and ideas to be able to engage with this heavy, hard stuff. Mm -hmm. Julius, is there such a thing as a right not to be offended? No, that's what the Ward case said. I think that's one of the most important things that I think I've achieved in my career, that I got the Supreme Court to say there's no right not to be offended. Now, when it comes to safe spaces, of course, the university should generally be safe. People shouldn't be attacked on campus. There should be a degree of physical safety. I also agree with Jim that people can have a private club if they want to meet uh, other people who have the same problems as they, they do. There's nothing wrong with that. That's freedom of association. But I think there is no intellectual safe space. There is no place where somebody cannot get up and uh, say something uh, that may be offensive to other people. And I do remember sitting in a Russian class where a girl put up her hand and said uh, she sympathized with the Nazis in her anti-communism. I thought it was preposterous, but I didn't go home crying. I just said, let, it, let her think whatever she wants. And uh, the, um, uh, the notion of uh, a safe intellectual space is antithetical to the university. So physical safety, yes. Any other safety, no. And uh, trigger warnings are not necessary. Uh, I, I think when you're studying subject, and it especially applies to humanities and social mm -hmm. sciences, necessarily controversial things. And uh, mm -hmm. think about it, should a, uh, should a professor in biology say trigger warning, we'll be talking about evolution tomorrow. So all creationists need not show up. It's a beautiful example. And on that note, we're gonna have to end unfortunately. And I know I didn't get through all the questions and uh, Jim, I know you have other, uh, uh, and I think another appointment. So you're gonna have to leave. The only thing left for me to do is to thank you, all of you for, playing along with this and, and, and spending the afternoon with us, sharing your thoughts on this. I'm hoping we're gonna do something again like this uh, uh, next year, perhaps, Jim, with more specific questions so we can be more focused. We'll see. So again, thank you so much. Um, I'll